such a privilege. Uh, let's see, I have to agree to record the meeting. There we go. Um, uh, a couple other acknowledgements before we go any further, assuming I can go any further. There we are. Um, I really owe my Darwin experience in part to Fred Burkhart, who you see here. Fred was the founding editor of the Collected Letters of Charles Darwin. He was a philosopher. He ended up being the, um, the number one biographer of, of William James, the pr pr pragmatism guy. He then became the president of Bennington College, and then he became the president of the American Council of Learned Societies. And then he chose to do the Darwin Correspondence Project as his retirement project. And that's how I met him. Um, he has to be the most kindly boss I've ever had uh, <clears throat> and never forgave me for not staying with Darwin for the rest of my life. And I'm also grateful to his wife, Ann. Uh, Fred and Ann spent, uh, and I and Nan spent a lot of time together. Um, and I had a wonderful month in Cambridge, England with them in the 19, mid 1970s. Etc. So I'm very grateful to them for the opportunity that they gave me. Now you might ask yourself, those of you who know me, why would a kid who grew up thinking he wanted to be a rocket scientist or to design race cars or something end up becoming a Darwin expert? And the short answer to that was that I was broke. Um, I graduated from Caltech in June of 72 and I started my doctoral program at the University of Pennsylvania in the fall of 72. And for the first semester I was there, I got a teaching assistantship, which paid my tuition and fees and gave me a little stipend and everything. I got to the end of the semester and there weren't any around, there were no scholarships or anything. So I went to my advisor and I said, Dr. Thackeray, I'm gonna have to take a year off and go work as a construction worker or something and earn some money because I don't have the money to go to, to do my coursework in grad school. And he said, well, don't, don't panic, we'll see what we can do. And the next thing I know, I got called by the librarian at the Library of the American Philosophical Society right next to the Independence Hall in Philadelphia. He said, come on down, we have a Mellon Fellowship for the Mellon Foundation. We want you to interview for the job. So I went down and interviewed for the job and I got it. And the job was to transcribe the 700 or so Darwin letters that they had, put them in chronological order and publish them in a book, which I did. Um, took me from 73 until 1975 to do that. Um, um, it's a terribly boring book unless you're a Darwin scholar. And the reason why they did it was because they had the second largest Darwin letter collection in the world. The biggest one is at Cambridge University in England. Uh, and it has about 9,000 Darwin letters. And the second one is at the APS Library of Philadelphia and they have about 700. So all the Darwin scholars who didn't have a lot of money to do research would use all their money to go to Cambridge, England and look at all those letters instead of going to Philly. So the Philly letters are being passed over by the research community. And this is a way to publish that book and allow people to read what was in at, at Philadelphia and order copies of the letters, et cetera. And as a result of that, I got to work on Charles Darwin um, pretty much eat, sleep, and think about nothing but this guy um, from January of 1973 on into 1976, full time in the summers and half time during um, uh, the school year when I took a half load of courses for my PhD. And um, since I put them in chronological order and I was looking at letters, I really got uh, a, a unique look at Charles Darwin um, somebody who interviewed me for it, you can go read, uh, listen to this hour long podcast by the Humanist Network News or whatever they called themselves. Um, uh, I told them that it's sort of voyeuristic. I was peeking over Darwin's shoulder all day long, every day in chronological order as his life unfolded. And of course, his correspondence was a particularly candid window into his life because he would disclose things to his most trusted correspondence that he wouldn't say in public. So you really got to know what he really thought. That was great fun. And as a result, um, I learned all kinds of things about Charles Darwin. And, and the, the real Charles Darwin is very, very different from the usual public persona. Uh, before I did this, you know, I, try, I knew who Charles Darwin was. I skimmed through the origin of species as a grad, a, you know, beginning grad student. 
but I didn't know much about him either, but I sure did learn a lot while I did all this. And so what I'm gonna do today is dispel a lot of myths about Darwin. He did not discover evolution. He was not the naturalist on the, on the HMS Beagle. Um, he was not a biologist, actually. He was a geologist way before he was a biologist. Um, and the argument, you know, that you hear all the time that he stalled for 20 years on publishing his book because he was scared to death of the religious implications of evolution and so on it, is baloney. It's just, it's not true. Um, so I'll, I'll talk some about his religious beliefs and about his attitudes about science as we go along. Um, it's really a fabulous life. He really, it's, it's an amazing story. And I really, you know, you're supposed to keep your subject at an arm's length if you're a biographer and a, a responsible historian, but everybody who's ever studied this guy up close has fallen in love with him. He's an amazing character. Um, and I should say there's two big myths about Charles Darwin. The first one is the one that everybody knows that he was a horrible fiend. Um, he was a conniver. He was um, uh, uh, hell bent on uh, uh, destroying religion and, uh, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and these are the kinds of stereotypes you see about Darwin all the time, that he degraded human beings by say that, saying that we're all just uh, um, non-hairy apes, um, et cetera, et cetera. And the second one, which is a little less publicly known, but which is um, generally believed by a lot of people who know a bit about Darwin, but don't know a lot about Darwin, although it's, this is changing um, nowadays, is that a lot, a lot of people characterize him as a bit of a dunce, that he was a playboy, he was a rich kid, uh, he practically flunked down of Edinburgh. Um, uh, his father thought he was good for nothing and sent him to Cambridge so that he could maybe pass with a gentleman's seat, then find himself a nice, uh, um, position as a minister in the Anglican church somewhere, um, et cetera. And it was just a fluke that he got to be on the voyage of the Beagle because he was uh, a rich kid and they needed somebody on the boat. Um, that, that's just baloney. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not true. And you'll see how it's not true as we go along. What is true is that he was a rich kid. Um, he grew up in the lap of luxury in lots of ways. His, father you see here on the left is named Robert Waring Darwin and he was a very very prominent physician very popular uh, renowned for having a good bedside manner uh, he had lots and lots of uh, patients uh, and he had a lot of money and he married Susanna Wedgwood and it's that Wedgwood the Wedgwoods of Wedgwood China um, from about 40 miles away from where he lived um, and they had a very good marriage, except for one thing, she died pretty young. And we'll talk about that in a minute or so. Um, they were both Unitarians. So they were not Anglican members of the Church of England, although Robert Waring Darwin had his son Charles baptized in the Anglican Church. But particularly his mother um, was, a, was a Unitarian, a dissenter as they called it then, and did not um, go to the Anglican Church. Um, although he did go to an Anglican school. He grew up in a place called Shrewsbury, which you see here. If you know your English geography at all, here's London way down here. And way up at the other end up here is Manchester, the sort of the, the centerpiece of the Industrial Revolution in some respect, and good old Liverpool where the Beatles come from. Um, and Shrewsbury is sort of right off of Birmingham. So it's it's there in the industrialized Northwest of England, but uh, off in the countryside. Um, and let's see if Chrissy's here, uh, a little aside light to Chrissy. Bristol down here, Chrissy is where the AC Ace car was made. <laughs> we just had a conversation about that. Um, uh, but that has nothing to do with Darwin. Notice Stoke on Trent right here. This is roughly where the um, Wedgwood Pottery Works was and where Darwin's mother came from, and we'll talk about them a lot in just a little bit. This is the house he grew up in. It's still there. It's now an assisted living facility. Um, so you can go there if you need a nursing home, want to live in England, you can go live in the house that Darwin grew up in. Obviously, it's a reasonably uh, uh, a substantial home. Um, I just found out recently that my great-great-grandparents um, 
in County Curry in Ireland lived in a four room house with two windows in the front of it and a piggery in the back. So I don't think they were quite as well off as Robert Waring Darwin and his wife and Charles. Here he was at age seven, um, a cute little kid. He was doted on by his family, the fifth of six children. Unfortunately though, his mother died shortly after they did that rendering of him. So he was sort of semi-orphaned then and his older sister, Catherine, sort of took over as his substitute mother. And he and Catherine were very, very close for the rest of their lives. Uh, Catherine, he and Catherine exchanged gobs of letters while he was sailing around the world and avoided the beagle, for example. Um, he certainly had a happy childhood and probably the best evidence of this, and this is one of those things where learning about the guy in chronological order by reading his correspondence is a particularly good window into this. Um, here he is as a teenager writing to a buddy of his in school in 1828, bragging about Fanny Owen, who lived about 10 miles away. Fanny and Sarah Owen were sisters. The Owen family um, uh, socialized with the Darwins all the time. And Fanny and Sarah were supposedly the liveliest two young women, eligible young women in all of Shropshire. And Fanny fell head over heels for Charles and Charles fell head over heel, heel with her. And they called each other the postillion and the housemaid. Uh, you can guess what a housemaid is. If you don't know what a postillion is, if you have a team of several horses pulling a carriage, you put a, a rider on the front left one and that purse, that rider makes sure that the team of horses goes in the right direction. So she called him her postillion, uh, he called her his housemaid and they derived the terms from a romantic novel that was popular at the time where this young couple, the postillion and the housemaid run off together into the forest. Um, so you can imagine what kind of a life they had at the time. Um, that's where Darwin comes from. Now, he's born in 1809. Actually, he's born on February 12th, 1809, the exact same day that Abraham Lincoln is born. So by 1828, you can do the math yourself, he's 19. Um, and during that time, it's not like there was no talk whatsoever about what we would today call evolution. There was actually a hotbed of debate, especially among people like dissenters, um, Unitarians, and people involved in the Industrial Revolution and talking about doing new scientific kinds of things about what they called the transmutation of species. They didn't call it evolution then. Um, um, it's, were there species that changed over time and became new species or were they all created within seven days as in the book of Genesis? Or if not, then at least individually created by God over time at different times. And they all started arguing about this before Darwin was even born. Probably the key guy is this fellow right here, James Hutton, who was the son of the city treasurer of the city of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, he inherited a big farm from his father. He loved chemistry. He became, he got a medical degree. Um, he was sort of a, 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 a Renaissance man. He did all kinds of interesting things. And he also got involved in the building of canals. And as a result of all that, um, he started seeing all these excavations um, because people started using steam powered equipment to excavate canals and build railroads and so on and to improve his farm. He carved up the farm he inherited from his father in all kinds of ways. And this is actually a, a spot on his farm that still survives today. And what did they discover? They discovered all these strata with fossils in them. <laughs> Um, and the fossils changed from, you know, the bottom to the top. Um, and there were all kinds of interesting minerals and so on. There are clearly layers of things here. And they started debating where that came from and how old it was. And he was the first person to start saying, the earth is a whole lot older than we thought it was. And if we're going to understand how it got from where it was a long time ago to now, we don't have to come up with any fantastic things like worldwide floods or ca catastrophic things. 
all we have to do is look at the processes that are going on today, like erosion and volcanism and this, that, and the other thing, and extrapolate those back and watch how they work over time. And they will explain to you where all this came from. That came to be called uniformitarian geology. And that's sort of the backdrop of Darwin's thinking as he's moving into these subjects. If you don't believe that people thought that species changed before Darwin, don't forget that Lamarck's famous inheritance of acquired characteristics, that the giraffe got its long neck because it was stretching to reach the tasty leaves at the tops of the trees. And um, if, if mom and dad stretched their necks a lot, then the child would be born with longer necks. It's sort of, if you went out and were a bodybuilder, and so you were very muscular, you'd be more likely to have muscular children. Um, that's the basic inheritance of acquired characteristics argument. And he publishes that in 1809, the year Darwin is born. So long before Darwin started fiddling around with this stuff, there are a lot of very knowledgeable people throughout the Western world, especially people who were influenced by the enlightenment and by the Industrial Revolution and the emerging enthusiasm for scientific knowledge, et cetera, who were already very much convinced that the evidence was increasingly strong, that the earth was a whole lot older than 10,000 years old, and it had been created in a lot longer than seven days, and species changed over time and became new species. They didn't know how, Exactly, they come up with all kinds of crazy arguments, but they were already well on their way to thinking along that when Darwin was still, you know, shooting birds for fun and, and, and sneaking off in the woods with Fanny Owen. Um, he had nothing to do with any of that. But as soon as he started going to serious school, he originally had a private tutor and then he and his older brother who he's very close to, they did chemistry experiments together and all kinds of other stuff. They both went to the Shrewsbury Academy, which was an Anglican Academy for a while. So he got pretty good education. And then um, his father, Robert Waring Darwin, actually took him when he was a teenager with him on the road to be his medical assistant for a whole summer. And Darwin sort of got interested in that. So his father said, well, maybe you could become a physician like me and like your grandfather. Um, so we'll send you off to the University of Edinburgh to get an MD degree. Now, when he did that, first of all, he ended up reading a rather long rambling, rather disorganized book that his grandfather wrote called Zoonomia, published before Darwin was born, which talks about medicine and science and the state of the earth and all kinds of other things and starts hinting around about Lamarckian evolutionary ideas, et cetera. And Darwin read that at about this time. And he goes off to Edinburgh and the guy he's primarily influenced by is this fellow here on the right, Robert Grant at Edinburgh. Um, <clears throat> he's an anatomy professor at Edinburgh. But he's also very interested in, uh, in things like uh, the study of invertebrates and seashores. And he falls, he, he starts to be, impressed by Darwin right away, asks him if he wants to come with him to do collecting along the Firth of Forth and other places, which he does. Um, meanwhile, Darwin hated med school. Um, he thought the lectures were boring and not very well informed. Uh, he ran screaming out of the room when he watched his first surgery. <laughs> he got sick at the sight of the blood. <laughs> Um, and he started thinking, I, I just can't be a doctor. And he, and he got pretty terrible grades too. Meanwhile, though, he was off collecting with Robert Grant and Grant uh, uh, talked him into joining a thing called the Plinian Society, which was sort of like a science club. Um, Plinian uh, is the name of a kind of volcanic eruption. Um, pl Plinian eruptions of volcanoes are the ones that shoot these gigantic plumes up into the sky. You know, so great big disruptive um, explosions. And they called themselves the Plinian Society because they got together 
and and uh, and debated uh, really explosive ideas. <laughs> that was where they got the idea for it. That was where Darwin did his first public presentation of results of scientific work. He had gone out with Robert Grant and studied things and came back and said that he had discovered that these little black dots on the inside of oyster shells were actually the, uh, the eggs of um, uh, a, a, a skate or something, uh, some kind of creature. And that there were these other little creatures that had uh, cilia. They had little, little wiggly um, legs that moved them around. And, and he reported on both of that at a Plinian Society meeting. It's the first time he presented results that were part of his own research. Um, so the idea that he was a dunce as a kid and a playboy just isn't true. His father thought he was because he was flunking out in med school. But all of the people that worked with him, like Robert Grant, thought he was really good, particularly as what we would today call a field naturalist. They're really good at observing things uh, out in the wild and then figuring out what they were. Um, and that continues on. Um, his father gives up on him as being a doctor. He says, forget it, you're never gonna be a doctor. So he pulls him out of Edinburgh and sends him to Cambridge University. And when he goes to Cambridge University, which is 1828, um, just about the time he's uh, head over heels in love with um, Fanny Owen, um, he falls in with these two guys, Adam Sedgwick and John Stevens Henslow. Sedgwick was probably the top geology guy. Henslow started out in geology too, but ended up in botany among other things, he's the guy who laid out the Cambridge Botanical Gardens. If you go to Cambridge, England, set aside a whole day just to wander around the Cambridge Botanical Gardens. That, I did that for two days while I was there. And um, two thirds of everything I know about botany I learned on those two days. It's an amazing place. And Henslow laid that out way back in the 1820s and 30s. Anyway, Henslow and Sedgwick were both ordained Anglican priests and also members of the faculty. And they were both field naturalists, went out and did work. And right away, as soon as Darwin got there, Sedgwick invited him to go with him doing geology field trips. Um, he already had a reputation for being really good at that. And Henslow did the same thing. So he had a real reputation for being you know, a collector and so on, observer. And Albert Way, who was one of his classmates, through this cartoon because Darwin was so obsessed about collecting beetles that they all teased him in the dorms for being a beetle nut. So um, Albert Way drew this cartoon and says, go it Charlie, and it's Charlie Darwin riding on a beetle with a net trying to catch beetles. And there's a famous story which Darwin wrote about to his friends, another advantage of, of, of studying in chronological order. <laughs> He was out collecting beetles and he found one really good one. He had it in his right hand and he found another really good one without it in his left hand. And then he flipped over a rock and there was a really good third one. So he popped the right one into his mouth and grabbed the other one. And the beetle then <coughs> squirted this foul acrid gunk into his mouth. <laughs> and he, it was so sickening, he spit it out and he lost all three of the beetles. <laughs> so that gives you some idea of what his life was like. He was just an avid collector. He was also a very good hunter. Um, although later, as you'll find out, um, the thing about him being mean-spirited, I'll tell you a little bit about his, his killing things, um, uh, ki killing animals and specimens and so on. So Cambridge for him was a romp. He, he learned an awful lot there and he earned the respect of all these people as a promising young man with an abiding interest in nature and natural history. He also did the thing that everybody did at the time. Uh, he graduates in 1831, five years earlier. Um, this very interesting fellow, fellow named William Paley, if you've never heard of him before, very important fellow, um, wrote this book called Natural Theology or Evidence of the Existence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature. Um, this is the famous argument from design. Why do we know God exists? Because nature is so amazing and so well designed, et cetera, it had to be done by some intelligence. Um, that was required reading of everybody. Darwin read it and bought most of it, sort of. Um, so at the time he graduates in 1831, 
his family are dissenters, so they don't necessarily believe in the Anglican Church. Um, till the day she died, for example, his wife, who we'll talk about a little bit, took the family to church, um, to the Anglican Church, but when they read the Nicene Creed about the existence of a triune God, they turned around and faced the back of the church and didn't say it because they were, they were Unitarians and didn't believe that. So he grew up in this sort of ambiguous um, climate and didn't quite know exactly what he believed at the time, but he still, he took a copy of the Bible with him on the voyage of the Beagle, and we'll get to that in a second. So, what happens? He graduates from Cambridge in June of 1831. And he had planned right after he graduated, after taking a month off or so, to go to Tenerife, the island of Tenerife, with one of his buddies from college named Marmaduke Ramsey. And they were going to go doing natural history field work at, at, at the island of Tenerife. <laughs> but Marmaduke Ramsey dies in July of 1831, a month after they've all graduated from college. So Darwin throws up his hands and said, well, there goes my summer. And he's back at Shrewsbury and isn't exactly sure what he's going to do next. He hasn't exactly become a, you know, a parson in some small country village or anything. So he didn't know what he was going to do. And what happens? He gets a letter dated August 24th, 1831 from John Stevens Henslow this guy right here, changed his life. Why? <laughs> because it said, <clears throat> Charles, I've been, I've been told by people that there is a, 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 a British naval vessel that's going to travel around the world and the captain wants to bring somebody on board, not to be the um, official naturalist there, but to be his companion. His name is Robert Fitzroy. Um, he became the captain of the Beagle because the captain before him committed suicide from loneliness and depression. And his uncle had also been a captain of a Royal Navy vessel and he committed suicide. So apparently that was an occupational hazard for, for captains of Royal Navy vessels. It was a very lonely and stressful occupation. So he didn't want to have that happen to him. So he asked around and he got Henslow to recommend to him somebody who would be intellectually of interest to him and might be able to do something useful traveling around the world and would also live in his cabin with him and keep him company so he wouldn't die of a depression, so on and so forth. Um, and he says, uh, Henslow says in this letter, um, he's looking for a naturalist as companion to Captain Fitzroy. And he says, I consider you to be the best qualified person I know of who is likely to undertake such a situation. I state this not on the supposition of your being a finished naturalist, but as amply qualified for collecting, observing, and noting anything worthy to be noted in natural history. Captain Fitzroy wants a man, I understand, more as a companion than a mere collector. In short, I suppose there never was a finer chance for a man of zeal and spirit. Don't put on any modest doubts or fears about your disqualifications, for I assure you, I think you are the very man they are in search of. Um, so Darwin gets this letter and he says, this is great. I'm gonna be able to travel around the world and do just what I wanna do uh, um, for I don't know how long. And, 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 and Henslow says, you gotta do it right away. It's August, they wanna sail almost immediately. You gotta make up your mind. And Darwin says, this is great. And he shows it to his father. His father says, it's a stupid idea, don't go. <laughs> And so Robert Rangarin tells him he can't do it. And Charles, Charles is absolutely crestfallen. So what does he do? He goes to his mother's brother, his uncle Joss. Um, this is Josiah Wedgwood Jr. or the second. He's the son of the guy who starts the Wedgwood Pottery Works and takes it over himself. He too is a dissenter, a believer in the enlightenment and reason and science and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, he's, he's Charles's uncle. And as soon as Uncle Joss hears that his brother-in-law has turned down this offer, he gets on his horse and he rides 40 miles to the mountain, Shrewsbury, and he, he puts 
he sits down Darwin's father and says, are you crazy? This is an opportunity of a lifetime. You have to let your son do this. And so Robert Waring Darwin changes his mind and says yes. And Darwin worshiped the ground that Uncle Joss walked on for the rest of his life um, because he got to go. Well, it happened really, really, really fast. Um, and as I said, he was not the naturalist on the Beagle. The official naturalist on the Beagle was a surgeon named Robert McCormick, who was in the military, in the Navy. Uh, here he is. Um, <laughs> Darwin disliked him from the beginning. Um, uh, he wrote back to Henslow and said, my friend, the doctor is an ass. We're preparing to go on the voyage. And all he has to worries about is what color they're going to paint his cabin. Um, uh, and he goes on and on. And you know, this is one of the other advantages of being able to look at the letters because he never would have said that in public. He was much too diplomatic and polite. Uh, anyway, it, it didn't work out. McCormick became increasingly uh, disgruntled with everything. And Fitzroy became increasingly wildly enthusiastic about how good Darwin was as a field naturalist. So when they got to Rio de Janeiro in South America, McCormick uh, got himself invalided out off the ship and he sailed back to England and gave up. So Darwin didn't start out as a naturalist, but he sort of became the naturalist um, uh, by, uh, by accident. So Darwin ends up sailing around the world in the same cabin with this fellow right here, Robert Fitzroy, um, actually a very bright guy and a really good ship captain. And he was crazy about meteorology. Um, he's the man who came up with the term forecasts for weather predictions. When you hear somebody say, here's a weather forecast, it's because Fitzroy came up with that term. Um, however, um, he was a very volatile fellow um, given to throwing huge temper tantrums. There was a, a point at which um, he was talking about slavery somewhere and wasn't very sympathetic about abolitionism and getting rid of slaves. And Darwin very timidly spoke up um, as saying that maybe, um, maybe you should be more tolerant of that. His father, his grandfather were both abolitionists. Um, and he said, you know, maybe these, these people are human beings and so on. And, and Fitzroy didn't speak to him for a week. Um, so anyway, he ended up writing back home saying about Fitzroy, some part of his brain wants mending. <laughs> but they ended up spending five years together and Darwin did all kinds of stuff. They sailed around the world. They went from England, all around South America, out to the Galapagos, across the Pacific, all across here, back up. They went back to South America and then back up. It took them five years. It was this little wooden boat, the HMS Beagle. Um, and Darwin went the whole way. The official assignment of the trip was to, to essentially map the coastlines and the harbors of all these places around the world so the British Royal Navy would be able to sail confidently in and out of ports, knowing how deep the water was and so on and so forth, where the channels were. Uh, that was the primary thing they did. But every time they landed, Darwin went out and did all this uh, naturalizing. and. Um, um, and also had lots of time to do other stuff. And the thing theoretically that he did probably the most was read the <coughs> first two volumes of what eventually became a three volume work by this guy, Charles Lyell, who became arguably, arguably his best friend or one of his two best friends. Um, he was uh, about 10 years older than Darwin. So he was sort of a, a mentor figure. And this book was an attempt to more systematically and thoroughly lay out that uniformitarianism idea that, um, <clears throat> that Hutton had. And um, this was the first, the first really systematic attempt to explain how old the earth probably was and how it came to be what it is today based upon the processes that are going on today acting on the earth over a very, very long time. And Darwin read it, actually Fitzroy bought the first volume and brought it on board with him. And then Darwin got the second volume sent to him from home. Um, 
And so they read the, the, that and it convinced Darwin that in fact, the earth was very, very old, which of course is very important if you're gonna argue that change over time in species is very, very gradual and you need a lot of time for evolution to occur. So he gets that just at the right time for that to fill his head with those kinds of ideas. Now, what does he do while he travels around the world? Well, first, he's a collector. This is actually some of the actual Darwin's finches that were brought, that he sent back to England. Um, and you'll notice things like, notice the beaks. This one's a big, fat, tough beak for cracking certain kinds of nuts. And these are little skinny beaks. This is a little pointed one for poking into fruits, etc. Each species was in a different habitat with different food. And so each species was adapted to the, the habitat that it had on its particular island. Um, but Darwin didn't know any of that. He just collected them all. He was very careful about labeling them and saying exactly when he caught them and exactly where he caught them. And the geography of the distribution of species is very, very important here. But Darwin knew he was getting some good stuff, but he didn't know exactly what he was getting. He was, as Henslow said, not a polished naturalist, but a really good collector and observer, et cetera. He also got to do something I don't think he expected when he started out, and that was he ended up being, doing a little bit of anthropology. The Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America had humans in it, which people call Fuegians, Fugians, they're pronounced differently. Um, Darwin was appalled when he met them. Um, because he thought they were extremely primitive savages. Uh, you can see the drawing of them here. Um, uh, and wrote about it back home and wrote it in his own diary and so on and so on and so forth. It, it transformed the way he thought about human beings. Um, before that, he thought that, you know, human beings uh, were all sort of like Englishmen. <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden he found out that obviously there were humans who he thought were almost not humans. And he was very shocked by that. And it really influenced the way he thought about human nature ever since. Um, and the third thing was more than being a biologist, even though he collected beetles and, and, and finches and the, talked about the, the turtles and the Galapagos, et cetera, he was as much a geologist as he was a biologist. In those days, they really didn't make the distinction all that much. They all said they were natural historians and they were doing natural history. But Darwin was as interested in the geology around the world as he was about the biology. And that's actually an important thing because if you're going to talk about speciation, the, geogra the geographic distribution of populations and species is a very important part of where speciation comes from. But one of the first books he published was a book not about biology and species and all that stuff. It was a book called The Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs. And it explained this kind of a phenomenon which he discovered and fell in love with out in the middle of the Pacific. It's this big ring of coral with a beautiful blue lagoon in the middle, and that's it. It's a bunch of coral with a big blue lagoon in the middle. They're very pretty and you know they do Hollywood movies about blue lagoons and stuff, um, et cetera. And he figures out that here's what happens. A volcano, this is the volcano, rises up from the ocean floor and pushes itself above the surface of the ocean. And when it does, it then provides this nice shadow area here for corals to take root and to grow in the sea all around the, all around the, the volcano. But once the volcano becomes dormant, of course, the the, the soft pumice volcanic ash er erodes really quickly, so it wears away. And when it wears away, it's down here, what's left of the volcano is underwater. And what you've got left is a ring of, of corals with the blue lagoon in the middle. And he writes a whole book about it. Um, this is the structure and distribution of coral reefs. It's published in 1842. You know, he, he published The Origin of Species in 1859. This is 17 years earlier. Um, so he's as much a geologist as he is um, um, a, um, a biologist. But he sends back his birds 
to this fellow in London, John Gould. And Gould was an astute ornithologist. And he sat Darwin down when Darwin got home in 1836. And he said, Charles, those birds that you sent me, they're different species. This is very interesting. Um, and that's really, it was Gould tipping Darwin off that he, had, he was onto something, that the species were distributed according to whatever habitats they were in, in all these isolated places, like on islands and stuff. He did the same thing, not with birds, but with all the vertebrate animals that he sent back. And those went to this interesting character here named Richard Owen. Um, if you've never heard of him before, you certainly know who he is for one reason, and that is he's the guy who coined the word dinosaur. Um, he was really good at uh, the skeletal remains of vertebrate animals and was the expert on dinosaurs. Um, so he certainly was agreeing that there were, that the earth was very, very old, but he wasn't convinced that the earth, that, that species changed over time and evolved into new species. So he and Darwin, they got along and Darwin sent him his stuff and so on and so forth. But over time, their relationship was increasingly tense. And one day he, he ran, Darwin ran into Richard Owen on the streets of London and they had a very, um, a, a very unpleasant encounter. And Darwin went back home and wrote to Charles Lyell and he said, Richard Owen is wonderfully clever, clever in his malevolence. Um, and they ended up not being the best of friends. Um, all, of the all of the remarks about Darwin's opinion of Richard Owen in every letter I've edited that were negative, that were unflattering, were left out of the published versions of those letters when Darwin's son, Francis Darwin, published The Life and Letters of Charles Darwin. He, he censored out all of the remarks about Darwin's opinion of, um, of Richard Owen. Um, we've, we've now put it all back in. I should say the Darwin family has been wonderful. When Fred Burkhardt approached them about doing the collected letters, they wrote back immediately and said, the entire family hereby gives you permission to publish anything and everything you find. No um, restrictions whatsoever. They've been very, very good for the project. Anyway, Darwin gets home in 36 and runs around like a chicken with his head cut off, trying to get all these publications out. He publishes a thing called the Journal of Researches, where he gives accounts of what he did, sort of like a, bio, a, a dear diary kind of thing. Um, he publishes a geology of, of South America, the Voyage of the Beagle. He does a zoology, although other people, including Gould and, and Owen and so on, wrote the zoology sections. Darwin just edited it because he didn't think he was good enough in zoology. Uh, um, or, or in biology to do the results, but he was learning really fast. He also was elected to the Royal Society. He was a secretary of the Geological Society of London, etc. And during that time, he's just filled with ideas as he's digesting everything he picked up for five years all over the world. He starts up opening up all these little red notebooks. One of them was the M notebook about metaphysics, about the ethical and religious and societal implications of what he's doing. That's one everybody talks about. But he had ones about, about um, barnacles and ones about geology and ones about this, that, and the other thing. And he scribbled in all of them very energetically during this time. And he was trying to figure out what to make of all the things he discovered. And right at that time, less than two years after he's um, back and he's trying to make sense of all this. He reads Malthus's um, essay on population. This is the famous thing where Malthus says, Popul you know, populations of, of life forms grow exponentially so fast that they outgrow their own food supply. And then they, and then they have horrible struggles and they die. And it was an argument that we should actually have sort of population control because it was hopeless to try to make society better because we were all going to we were all going to reproduce too fast and and, and drive ourselves to, to misery and starvation. Um, 
Uh, that was basically what he wrote. But Darwin read that and he said, they wrote this wonderful letter. He said, here then, I had at last got a theory by which to work where he says, aha, that's why the, the, the sort of random variation of a species where the, you look at the individuals of like birds and they, some of them are big and some of them are small and some of them are red, some of them are blue. Da, 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 da. Look at all the different kinds of people you've seen in the world. Um, it's because they're struggling to survive against all their competition that the ones who are better adapted to the conditions they're living under are the ones who are gonna make it. So the conditions they're living under select the people who are best, the, the, the individuals who are best adapted. It's natural selection. And that's where he gets the idea. By 1838, he's, he's grasping that very, very tightly. And he says, this is what's going on. But then right at the same time, 1836, he takes a vacation because he's exhausted from everything he's been doing. And he goes for a few weeks up into Scotland and he, 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 he tours this interesting glen way up in the north of Scotland called Glen Roy. And it has this feature in it where these, there are these things that look sort of like beaches, like seashores all around it. Here's a drawing of it. And they're called the parallel roads of Glen Roy. And the same way that, you know, we've got people speculating that ancient astronauts came and did the glyphs on the plains in South America and everything. People said, oh, these were ancient peoples who built roads there, et cetera. And Darwin said, that's nonsense. But what he did was he wrote a speculative paper based on um, Lyle's ideas about the earth going up and down, the seas going up and down and processes today um, um, uh, being extrapolated backwards. He go this complicated theory about why there were these particular three lines. And as soon as he publishes it, almost immediately after he publishes it, Louis Agassiz, um, who was born in Switzerland, the Alps, and studies glaciers in the Alps, uh, becomes a, 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 natural, a, a naturalist in lots of specialties, ends up at Harvard here in the United States and becomes, among other things, the expert on the Ice Age. He was the first person to strongly argue for there being an Ice Age when lots of North, North, uh, Northern Hemisphere was covered with ice, and then it receded again. Um, he's the first person who really got people to start believing that. And he wrote about Glen Roy, and he said, those different levels are where, as the ice retreats, <coughs> it shrinks, the water drains out through this opening on one end of the glen and then at this other one over here, et cetera. And Darwin and Len Lyle too, took one look at that and said, Charles, you've been scooped. <laughs> you know, your theory is just nuts. Um, uh, Agassiz is right. And Darwin was mortified. If you look at his letters after he discovered that he screwed up that article, um, over and over and over again. He says, what a stupid blunder I've made. It's so horrible. I feel like a, you know, I've ruined geology. People aren't gonna respect any of my field work anymore because they're gonna think I'm a nutcase. Da, 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 da. Years later, a young man wrote to him and said, Darwin, give me advice on how I should pursue a career like yours. And this is what he writes back to the guy. I would suggest to you the advantage at present of being very sparing in introducing theory in your papers. I formerly erred much in geology in that way. Let theory guide your observations. That's double underlined in the letter. <clears throat> but till your reputation is well established, be sparing in publishing theory that makes persons doubt your observations. That was why Darwin took 20 years to do the origin of species. Had nothing to do with him quaking in his boots about God, it really didn't. And if you read his, his, you know, you read his correspondence every day, day after day for those 20 years, you can tell right away that this is what got him going. Well, right at that time, he decides to settle down. Um, the sad part of the Fanny Owen story is that she gave him a lock of her hair to take with him on the voyage of the Beagle. 
And I'm proud to say I'm the one who found that in Cambridge, England in the summer of 1975. But she accepted a proposal of marriage from somebody else named Biddulph 12 days after he sailed on the voyage of the Beagle and didn't find out until Carolyn wrote him a letter and said, I got some bad news for you. And then she sent him a Dear John letter, which he received while he was in South America. So she married somebody else. Byron came home not knowing what he was going to do, but he decides in 1839 to marry who? His first cousin, Uncle Joss's daughter, Emma Wedgwood. It's his first cousin. Here she is. <laughs> um, uh, before he proposes to her, he actually takes out a piece of paper and he writes one column about why he should marry and one column about why he shouldn't marry. And on the, on the prose, it's sort of things like companionship, someone to give me comfort in my old age, blah, 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 blah. And on the why he shouldn't marry, one of, I think the funniest one is he said, I would have less money to buy books because I'll be spending it on my family. <laughs> but he decides that getting married is a good idea. He proposes to Emma and they're married in January of 1839, their first child, William is born in December of 1839. And at that time, they're living on Gower Street. Um, it's about a block and a half from where Carnaby Street was back in the 60s with uh, Mary Quant and the uh, mini skirts and the whole uh, sort of 60s uh, London scene. <laughs> it's about a block and a half from that. Um, they move in 1842. They've got a couple kids, um, et cetera, and Darwin is, is starting to be sort of overwhelmed with too much work and feeling sick, um, et cetera, and wanting to get away from all the hustle and bustle and just work on his stuff. Um, so they moved to this place called Downhouse. It looks a bit like the Mount where he grew up in Shrewsbury uh, in 1842. Here's where it's located, still there. You can go see it. It's very wonderfully preserved. I have certainly been there. Here's London. Canterbury is way off here. Um, it's about a little less than 20 miles outside of town. This is now the beltway around London. So it's sort of out where you would expect a beltway on the edge of a city. Um, beautiful house, da 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 da. Anyway, they, he moves out there and right at the time that they're in the process of doing that, his life is sort of disrupted. They've got two kids. Um, he decides that he might die. He's starting to feel really sick. So they take time off and where did they go? They go to Shrewsbury to his parents' place, and they go to Mare um, in Etruria in Stoke-on-Trent area, which is Emma's parents' place. It's Uncle Joss's place. So he goes to his, his parents and his in-laws, and they hang out there in the summer of 1842. And while he's there, away from everything else, he writes what he calls the first pencil sketch of species theory, written at Mare in Shrewsbury during May and June <coughs> 1842, this is the first time he tries to sketch out the idea of evolution by natural selection. He never claimed that evolution was his thing. The thing that was his was the process by which it happened, which was natural selection. And just as he's working on that, um, along comes Auguste Comte, the, the creator of the term positivism, um, the guy who created the term uh, sociology and altruism, and he's uh, influenced by the disruption of the French Revolution and then people recovering from that and so on and so forth and moving on from monarchies to democracies and the enlightenment. And he comes up with this complicated theory where he says, over time, human society gets better and better and better. And it goes through three, three phases. The first one is the theological, where essentially he was, he was pretty opposed to organized religion. He said, that was when everybody just, they, they didn't know what they were talking about. They just had these beliefs and they believed in um, uh, uh, things that worked that held the society together, but they, they were made up. And then they went through a period of some confusion where they realized they had to depend on their own judgment and inductive reasoning and so on and so forth. So it became metaphysical and they were studying that stuff, but they didn't know much. They had to go out and do more work and so on. That's the metaphysical transitional phase. And then finally, people use reason and evidence and you know, science, et cetera. And they come up with the laws of nature and the laws of everything else, including the laws of society, which is where sociology comes from. And then everything will be rational. 
he was sort of utopian about all this. Darwin loved that. <laughs> he said, that's for me. And he's considered sort of the, <coughs> the creator, of the, <coughs> the, the first, first movement towards what's called philosophy of science. And so that's what Darwin does. He sets out to do that kind of stuff. And then just as he's working on all that, he gets clobbered again on this problem about using theory too speculatively early on. This guy, a journalist named Robert Chambers, publishes this thing in 1844 called Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. It's a bestseller. Everybody's talking about it. And it's saying species evolve. Transmutation is real. And here are the ways that it works. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's just speculating like crazy. Here's the book. Um, it's not the first edition. I couldn't afford that. This is the 11th edition, um, but one of my prized possessions. Anyway, Darwin goes bananas when this book gets published. And he says, how could somebody poison the climate for discussing transmutation and species variation by coming up, you know, reproducing this, this garbage. It's just a bunch of crazy stuff. Um, Chambers publishes it anonymously. So Darwin calls him Mr. Vestiges um, and, and, and rants for months with everybody about it. That's really what he's interested in. He doesn't care about going to church. <laughs> in fact, um, he stopped going to church in 1849. Here's Emma. Everybody talks about it. Emma was concerned about his saving his soul and everything. And she writes this long letter, may not the habit in scientific pursuits of believing nothing till it is proved that it influence your mind too much in other things, which cannot be proven the same way, so on and so forth. So he's sort of arguing for um, you know, religion having its own sphere different from science, et cetera. What she was most worried about, and she said it to him over and over and over again, is she was afraid that they would not end up being together in the afterlife. And so we, I would be most unhappy if I thought we did not belong to each other forever. She was terrified that Darwin might go to hell and there really was an afterlife and she would go to heaven and she wouldn't be with him anymore. And he was very polite to her about it. He got some advice from his father about how to talk to women about such things, et cetera, but it was not his issue. He spent 20 years working on all this stuff in the 1840s and 50s, besides doing all the stuff that he was already interested in, he also published four big fat volumes on barnacles. He became the world's expert on the whole family of, of barnacles, the called serapedes. Two, four fat volumes. And he was, you know, he was dedicated to becoming a rigorous scientist, not just a speculator. You come up with theory, but then you prove the theory by nailing it to the wall, by doing really rigorous research. And that was what he was doing. By 1856, Lyle was saying, Charles, you gotta, you gotta buckle down and start writing your big book about this natural selection thing that you keep talking about. So Darwin did. This is Darwin's study at Downhouse. I've been there. I'm happy to say I sat in that chair, which is the chair he wrote The Origin of Species in. It has blocks underneath it because he had very long legs. So you're sort of propped up on a high chair there. And there is this rack here with these shelves. This is where he was putting the chapters of what he called his big book. The portions of it have now been published since. It's called Charles Darwin's Natural Selection. Um, and uh, that was what he was doing. He was trying to do all, uh, you know, consider every angle of everything having to do with natural selection and have enough uh, evidence and so on, <clears throat> rigorous arguments to make the case to everybody. Going along just fine, working away. And then <laughs> in 1858, May or June, he gets a letter from a guy he's corresponded with a little bit, a field naturalist, just like him, just like what he did on the Voyage of the Beagle, who's down in Indonesia in a little place called the uh, Ternate. His name is Alfred Russell Wallace. He's not rich like Darwin making a living collecting specimens for, for collectors back home. And he sends Darwin a little 4,000 word essay on natural selection. And Darwin absolutely dies. He says, he, write, he writes to Lyle and uh, uh, Joseph Dalton Hooker from 
Kew Gardens and says, I'm ruined. I've been working 20 years on this, but this guy writes to me, he sends me this and asks me to convey it to the Linnaean Society to be read at their meeting um, if, I, if I think it's any good. And I can't in good conscience not do that because it's really good. It's my theory. <laughs> um, so Lyle and Hooker and everybody say, we can't let Darwin be completely scooped by this. Um, it's clear that Wallace, Darwin himself outright says, I don't believe Wallace got his ideas from anything I've ever written. He did, he did the same thing I did. He went out and traveled around the world and noticed that species are separated geographically and that that's where they come from, from the geographic isolation of new species. So he says, I have to publish it, I'm ruined. And they say, no, 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 you're not ruined. And so what do they do? Lyle and Hooker, his two buddies, take that 44, that uh, 4,000 word thing that, that, that um, Wallace wrote, and they take Darwin's pencil sketch from 1842, or maybe the 1844, I forget, plus a letter that he wrote um, uh, uh, early on telling people about natural selection. Oops. And they read it before the Linnaean Society on July 1st. And so the two of them together get equal credit for coming up with the idea of natural selection. As soon as this happens, Lyle says, I told you, Darwin, you shouldn't have stalled so long. I'm trying to nail everything to the wall. Forget your damn big book with all of its details in it. Write a little precy of your important points and get it published as soon as possible. And that's what he does. From the summer of 1858 to about the summer of 1859, he takes the whole big book. It was already 10 chapters written. And he condenses it all down. He throws out lots of his evidence. And he says, I'm going to publish a little one volume book instead. And um, uh, Lyle gets his publisher, Lyle's publisher for the geology work, John Murray, to, to agree to publish the book. And Darwin sends this, this draft of the title page for the book through Lyle to uh, John Murray, the publisher, in March of um, 18, um, 1859. That is inside a letter that I transcribed in Philadelphia. The day I opened that folder up and looked at that letter, you can imagine the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I'm holding in my hand Darwin's handwritten draft of the title page, The Origin of Species. And what does it say? It says an abstract of an essay on the origin of species and varieties, blah, 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 blah. blah. Well, Murray takes one look at this and he says, I'll be damned if I'm gonna publish a book that's only an abstract of an essay. So he wants to scratch that. And Darwin writes back, uh, Lyle tells Darwin that, Darwin writes back to Lyle, I am sorry about Mary objecting to the term abstract as I look at it as the only possible apology for not giving references and facts in full, but I will defer to him and to you, yada, 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 and he goes on. So that's what they do. They scratch this first line. And that's why the book is called On the Origin of Species rather than The Origin of Species because they scratch it out of this um, draft. It gets published on November 24th, 1859, a whole 1,250 copies. They all sold out on the first day. There was an explosion of interest and a whole lot of enthusiasm for how thorough Darwin was, even without all the facts and notes and so on of the big book. Um, uh, you can get one today. There were three of them for, on sale two weeks ago, the last time I checked. It's going to cost you $400,000. Um, I've got one, but it's not a first edition. This is a 33,000. Yes, this is a 33,000 published after Darwin died by Mary. I bought it for 10 bucks back in the 70s, it's now worth 900. Uh, but I almost bought one of these for $1,000 in 1975. And I've been kicking myself ever since. Fred bought one and he said, you wanna get one too? I said, I don't have the money, Fred. He said, I'll lend it to you. I said, I can't do that. So I didn't get it. I sure wish I had now. <laughs> anyway, Darwin did not focus a whole lot on the whole eighth thing. The only mention of human beings as a species in the entire book is right at the end, the last couple pages, where he says 
there is grandeur in this view of life. There's going to be more work that looks at the life this way. And when they do that, life, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Um, that's all he says. But all they talk about in the next year, in all the debates and everything, is that Darwin says we're descended from apes. <laughs> there was a big fight over this. There was a giant argument at a, a British association meeting in Oxford, England, the summer of 1960, where Robert Fitzroy, the captain of the Beagle, gets up waving the Bible. Um, and saying, you know, when he's guilty for, for, for helping Darwin do this awful thing, um, et cetera. And there's a big fight between Wilberforce and Huxley about um, who's, whether it was his, their, their descended from apes on the mother's side or the father's side, et cetera. Um, and sadly, Fitzroy committed suicide in 1865 in part because of this. But Darwin just kept right on going. He started publishing in great detail all those chapters that he didn't publish before um, um, of the big book, as it's called. So he did a thing on the expression of the emotions and man and animals. He did two big books on animals and plants and domestication. The first thing he said is, you want to look at varieties of species, look at dogs, look at pigeons. You know, he studied pigeon breeders like crazy. Um, there's a there's a weird breed of pigeon called the almond tumbler. Uh, it doesn't fly straight. It flies for a while and that does a reverse somersault and it flies again. There's all kinds of things like that that he studied in enormous detail. Um, and it was plant breeders, you know, the, the Luther Burbank thing that, that got him started on trying to figure out where species change comes from. Now let's quickly in just two minutes, give you a little bit on religion and, and then we'll be done. Um, there are two separate issues on Darwin and religion. The first one was, where does our knowledge come from? And is there God? The, the first one is, you know, do we have received the mutable truth that was given to humans by a higher authority? You know, the, the classic question of dogma, and the Bible and other sacred texts. Um, Darwin believed that initially. Um, he read the Bible very carefully. He read the evidences of Christianity, et cetera. But by the time he got home from the voyage of the Beagle, he didn't believe it anymore. Uh, he thought that there were too many inconsistencies between what he'd seen around the world, especially things like that crazy, those crazy people in Tierra del Fuego and so on and so on and so forth. And he saw how many species there were all around the world. Hello. Hi, how are you? Couldn't Hello. talk. Hello. Couldn't possibly imagine them all um, being crammed onto Noah's Ark, etc. So he, he left that early. But the other thing is, he, for a long time he couldn't figure out whether or not there was a deity behind humans. I won't, I won't read you all of this, but he, he started out being an Anglican, but he was unorthodox because of his dissenting uh, Unitarian family. He became a theist by the time the origin appears, and he says here. Da, 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 da. When that's reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause. Having an intelligent mind is some degree analogous to that of man. I deserve to be called a theist. So he thought, I don't necessarily believe in a Christian God, but I do believe that there's, there's a something. Um, but then he says, that crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. The rate was so slow that I felt no distress. I've never since doubted, oops, even for a single second that my conclusion about Christianity was correct. Um, then from the time he publishes The Origin until he dies, he says that his theism very gradually with many fluctuations became weaker. He started thinking that maybe the mental faculties of humans had evolved also. And that you could explain really complicated things like the development of the eye by just blind natural selection over time. And as he, and the Teodoro del Fuego thing weighed on his mind a lot. He wrote about it a lot. Um, so he started saying, I can then, cannot pretend to throw the least light on such abstruse problems. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us. And I, for one, must be content to remain an agnostic. And that's where he left it in terms of what he claimed to everybody. He died. If he became more of that than an atheist, I think it's probably because of Annie. Annie was their second child. 
she was the apple of, of his eye <coughs> and she got scarlet fever. Um, and then from scarlet fever, she just declined further, probably got tuberculosis and she died at age 10 um, while he was taking her to a water cure to try to save her life. And he was totally bereft for years. Um, so if he ever thought there wasn't a God, it was because he thought no possible benign God could let her die. Um, let's see. If you are gonna go to Downhouse, I recommend that you do one thing. Way at the back of Downhouse, he created this little sort of jogging trail for himself called the Sandwalk. You can actually go on Google Maps and go to Street View and do it online. You can tour this and go around the exact same track that Darwin looped around on for his lunch break or for you know, a break from his work um, right now on, on, uh, uh, on the internet, if you'd like to do it. Uh, but I recommend that you go there and do it live, which I did back in 75, uh, one of the great moments of my life. <coughs> anyway, finally Darwin keeps on publishing stuff, et cetera. He gets increasingly ill from heart disease, and he finally dies at age 73. Um, he actually lived 73 years, two months and seven days, died on April 19th, 1882. Um, I'm going to be the same age as Darwin when he died next May 19th. So take a look at me. That's how old Darwin was minus a year when he died. Although back then they didn't have Lipitor and blood pressure drugs. And they didn't tell people to jog and lose weight when they, um, uh, when they had heart problems or possible heart problems. They told him to take it easy <laughs> and eat all the wrong foods. So he might have lived longer if uh, he had been around at the time. Where did they bury him? They buried him in Westminster Abbey. This is Darwin's grave right here. Um, a very, very big funeral ceremony in Westminster Abbey. Isaac Newton is buried in the same room. Charles Lyell is buried in that same room. Right next to him is um, uh, John Herschel. John Herschel, his father, William Herschel, were famous astronomers. Herschel was something of a, um, a, a, a Renaissance man. He identified seven of the moons of Jupiter. Uh, he's the man who invented blueprints. Uh, he was very interested in color blindness and photography. Uh, he did lots of other things in astronomy. Um, and Darwin liked him so much that he sent him a free copy of The Origin of Species in November of 1859. And now they're side by side together. And unfortunately for Emma, Emma agreed to let Charles be buried in Westminster Abbey in London, because everybody said he's so important to the world. But here she is buried in the churchyard in Down, near Down House in Kent. So her worst fears were realized. Um, the two of them are not together in all uh, eternity, at least not their corporal remains. <laughs> anyway, that's the story of Charles Darwin and you're now much better informed than most people who know all the popular stuff. I've learned a lot from Charles Darwin, a lot. I'm very grateful, but um, I wanna dedicate my talk to my brother. Um, I've learned a lot more about inheritance from him than from Darwin. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. That was excellent. Does any, if anybody has any questions, they can put them in the chat. Otherwise, it was a excellent. Always good, Tom, as, as usual. <laughs> we love your chats. One of my favorite talks. Any questions? Anybody write anything? Just uh, telling you fabulous. Oh, <laughs> please. <laughs> can I look at them? Do I, I, you, I, you can if you. At the chat on the bottom, if you go, I think you have to exit your full screen, maybe. I exit my full screen, okay. Oh, look at all these people. Hi, Chrissy. Didn't see her before. Hey, Paul. And then the chat oh, along. Did they put you to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see, chat. There's only one thing in there. Yep. Oh, Molly, thanks, Mal. <laughs> I'll buy you a beer next time I see you. <laughs> That it? Anybody else? That's it, I guess. Wow. Anyway. Thank you. Thanks. Lots of thank Amy you. Aaron. Hi, Amy. I didn't see you. 
Anyway, 